Okay, so welcome to the Mayal series, Organization, Sanitation, and Kitchen Safety at Home. And it's presented by um, our own Professor Dean Louis. And we're gonna be learning about how to keep ourselves safe. You know, we're all having lunch now or had lunch. So we wanna make sure we don't, um, you know, that we're safe and don't get food poisoning or anything like that. So thank you, Dean, for helping us out in this uh, area. Ooh. My pleasure. Thanks everyone for participating. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started. If you have any questions, just, you know, ask Joyce or raise your hand. All right, so I thought about this. I thought, you know, for my out series to clean your kitchen up or make sure that you have a better understanding about how these things work. Now, are you seeing the full screen? Or are you seeing this um, ribbon on the side of people? Yes, we are seeing the full screen. Thank you. Okay, good. That's good. Okay, so this is organizing your kitchen at home. Everybody has a little kitchen lamb, right? So it's good to maintain your kitchen. You don't have to be a type A, but it's good to clean it once in a while, right? So the requirements of this particular seminar is there's no exams. It's not writing intensive. There are no time constraints or tools or judgments, right? If you want to disclose something yourself personally, hey, that's all voluntary. We're not going to go and look in your fridge. Um, there's very little cost to organizing and sanitizing your kitchen as well. It's just basically elbow grease. And even if you have kids at home, they can help and understand why we need to keep our kitchen clean, right? So first off, myth or fact, plastic boards are more hygienic than wood boards. What do you think, yes or no? You can ponder that for a while. We're gonna keep going. Freezing food eliminates foodborne illness, yes or no? Defrosting in the sink is okay. Adding oil prevents pasta boil overs. Well done, meat is safe. And the last one that everybody kind of wonders, hey, the last meal I ate made me sick. Right, so going back, you know, plastic boards aren't necessarily more hygienic than wood. Wood has tannins in them. And so sometimes plastic cutting, cutting boards with the uh, heavy use, um, they have cuts in it and it harbors more bacteria than the wood boards. The wood boards dry and the tannins really kind of repel the, um, they repel the bacteria. Uh, freezing food does not eliminate foodborne illness or foodborne pathogens. Um, if the food already has some pathogens or bacteria on there, or it has um, been sitting out for a long time, when you defrost it, it'll just be even worse. Um, it depends on the size of the product that you have. To defrost in the sink under running water, you know, if you have some shrimp, it's okay. But if you have a full turkey, it's not okay. It all depends on time and temperature. Uh, I've always learned that oil in pasta water prevents pasta boil, boil, boil overs. But when I started doing my apprenticeship, my apprenticeship several, several years ago, you know, the chef said, that's just the waste of oil. It's the pot you use and the size of the pot that really helps prevent um, your boil over. So you use a, twice the size you need to boil pasta. And the rule is one gallon of hot boiling water to one pound of pasta. So you make, if you're making a pound of pasta, use an eight quart or two gallon pot. Well done, meat is not the safest. Actually, it's, um, you cook the hell out of it, which you can, but if you leave it out, uh, the longer you leave it out, the, the more it becomes compromised. And usually it takes about eight to 12 hours for bacteria or any pathogen in your body to get you sick. Unless it's an allergen or something that is, you know, really, really terrible, it takes at least eight hours. So, you know, sometimes people get upset at restaurants and they just ate and they get sick. It usually is something to do with over drinking and sunburn, typically. Right. Anyway, your own home deserves the same kind of attention that restaurants do. We, so we think about the way we purchase this product, the way we store product, uh, the way we prep it, heat it, cool it, um, and reheat it. Right. So for today, we're going to talk about assessing space, needs, and tools. We're talking about organization and storage, basic cleaning, 
food preparation and also personal hygiene, which, you know, if anybody's helping you in the kitchen, they can, they can learn a little bit about personal hygiene as well. Uh, we have our rotary meetings at the Lion of Jodo Mission now, and this is this basically we're in the back. And so this is the old style outdoor kitchen. And so whether you're in or out, the same rules kind of apply, right? So I'm going to reduce, let me just see if I can reduce, um, sorry. Anyway, so assessing space. So what I typically do, and I hate to do it, is I'm always cleaning my refrigerator out because what happens, you have this nasty cycle of buying things from the grocery store, making the food, putting it back in the fridge, and then seeing if you can reuse it or not. So um, refrigerator space is a luxury and it also is very highly covered. Um, typically, if you open a fridge, it's jam packed, especially with large families. So how do you ma manage it? It's the same thing with the restaurant. So typically what I do is I empty my refrigerator, clean the whole thing out from top to bottom using basically soapy water um, and, and, and looking at things that I haven't used for a long time. Same thing with the dry pantry. I'm always reevaluating my, re my space in my pantry in those hardest to find, hard to reach spaces. So I'm always looking for things to take out and re, either recycle, give away, or throw away, or give it to the food bank, right? So I would say that typically, you know, I clean the fridge out regularly, um, but once a month, I take the, every shelf out and I clean it and sanitize it because that's the place that can grow mold and mildew. And those things can really help populate the kitchen. Also, I keep a, a digital thermometer inside there. And temperatures should be 41 and below in your refrigerator, right? Um, and nothing helps better than a digital thermometer that helps man manage it. Sometimes um, it can be a forebearer if, if your refrigerator is not running correctly or it needs to be clean in the screens and the tines in the back. And if, you're, if your refrigerator is running high, it'll spoil all the food you purchased. So the temperature danger zone is 41 to 135. In the industry, we say keep cold foods cold and hot food hot, just to make sure it's safe. Um, this is a trick question, but you know what temperature should the frozen food be at? Right? So that's a, actually a serve safe certification question. And the answer is it should be frozen solid. So there is no temperature, but freezing starts at 32 and under, but 32 is not frozen yet. You can have your refrigerator at 32 and everything is basically solid. So you want, you want your products frozen solid to make sure that your freezer works correctly, right? The other things I think about, and because here I am at Lion uh, Education Center, I've made sure that all of our fire extinguishers are uh, recertified um, and, and up to date. And those little smoke detectors that are rising above you in your home or at work, uh, they need to be valid as well. Um, and they need to have batteries in them so that uh, they work. So when I came in here, the last data on our smoke detectors were 2007, right? 13, 14 years old. And some of them didn't have batteries or the batteries were no longer working. So we put in new, new smoke detectors to make sure that if there is a, a fire that we can get out um, and uh, you know, make sure that all the hallways are clear. But a small fire extinguisher under your sink, easily accessible is really important. You don't have to admit you're a bad cook, but just in case something like that happens, whether it's inside or out, is really um, invaluable. And then the other thing I think about for assessing space is cleaning the vents, whether it's the grease vent above your range, which typically just recycles air, but clean those out because sometimes there's a little pipe that goes up to the top of the ceiling or the roof. And then the, the vents around your refrigerator, make sure that those are um, clean and sanitary because in any kitchen, it's greasy, right? And talking about vents, make sure your dryer vent is clear as well. Let's see, let's go forward. Okay, so organizing and storage. Um, I like plastic wrap. Plastic wrap is part of our industry and we use it all the time and we cover food um, regularly to make sure of a couple of different things. Number one, 
it makes sure that it's sealed. So if something tips over in a busy and uh, packed, packed refrigerator, it doesn't spill and contaminate other things, cross contamination. It also eliminates odor for onions, green onions, ginger, patisse, whatever you have in the fridge. It makes sure that those uh, odors are minimized. And it also re reduces the, uh, the evaporation of product. The refrigerator wants moisture to run. And if you don't cover your food, it starts to get dried out. And all that money you spent on your food starts to look shriveled and unappetizing. Uh, a lot of us use or reuse some of the containers we now get from COVID-19, and it's okay for a limited amount of time. Um, but I also I always reassess these containers. I don't hoard Costco chicken containers or Foodland pokey containers. Um, I can use it for something in the garden, or I can recycle them. But I use those ones that are a little bit more robust, right? Uh, I make sure that they're not cracked or chipped. Um, because those can compromise your food as well or make sure that or have things leak all over your refrigerator. And the other thing is it might be, again, because I'm in the you know, hospitality industry, but I use this painter's tape. They have different colors now, blue, pink, brown, uh, orange. You can get this painter's tape, which is not quite as tacky as masking tape. And it doesn't leave that adhesive residue on there. And I get a nice black Sharpie. And I have a couple of Sharpies in there because if it gets wet, it'll dry again, but you can't use it when something's wet. So I typically, you, I can reuse maybe mayonnaise jars or something like that, or jars that I buy, mason jars. And I put a little piece of tape and I cut both ends so it's square. And I print carefully in legible type what the product is uh, with a Sharpie. And that helps me organize. It also helps me look at a glance. So. Um, just by working in the industry, I always front face my labels of condiments so I know what they are in, a, in an instant and it's easy to read. Now, you, some of you might think, oh, you're going too far, but it looks neat in your kitchen too. If you have beer or drinks or anything, I face the label forward. It looks pleasurable. And if somebody's looking for something, it's easy to find because who asks where things are? The spouse all the time. <laughs> Honey, where's this? Where's that? It's right there. I align the label so you can see it. The other thing we look at is washing your food bags. We all bring recyclable food bags in our grocery stores now. And when's the last time you washed them? Right? If it's not washed, chuck it, get a new one. Um, if they're washable, if they're damaged, if they're frayed, it's good to get a new one because those things get reused and reused and reused and you don't wanna have your wonderful cold bottle of chilled white wine break when you're carrying it home, right? The other thing, if you're doing multiple trips, I typically put a small cooler or a collapsible cooler in my trunk if I'm gonna make multiple trips and I can put stuff in the cooler, keep it cold until I get home. Those are just little tricks that we usually do uh, when we're buying large amounts of food, whether it's for a potluck or whether it's for home. Uh, the other investment is a food vacuum sealer. It's, what is it called, food saver? So that you can get it at Costco or the different department stores. Sometimes it's worth using if you're buying large bulk products and you wanna use it for other things. Um, the food savers, as opposed to a Ziploc bag, um, really seals out the moisture and also seals the oxygen. So it can hold in your refrigerator, refrigerator longer or it holds in your freezer uh, without getting frostbitten. Uh, and also, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, you can use those food bags. If you season the food, vacuum it in, you can use it for the um, immersion circulating, which I'll talk about a little bit later. If you have a lot of stuff and you like to buy stuff, it's like clothing. Anytime you buy a new piece of clothing, get rid of three pieces, right? It makes space, unless you have a huge warehouse that you're living in. Um, so give it away, make someone's day. Give it to the thrift store, the food bank. You can unload china, glass, and silver if you have a lot of that stuff. Any chip glasses, anything with logos that you don't need anymore, you can give it away. Um, some of the uh, shelters could use some of that product. Uh, tools and appliances that you don't normally use. If you haven't used it for maybe six months or a year, you might want to consider giving it away or putting it on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. I've gotten a lot rid of a lot of things that way. And you know, 
maybe just get a couple of bucks for it, but at least you're making somebody happy. They're getting a deal. Uh, but those are the things we look at usually um, just to, you know, to unload some stuff. And that's, it's a good feeling when it's spring recess and spring break anyway, right? So basic cleaning, what's the difference between cleaning versus sanitizing? So this is a big one for the COVID era, right? And so this is a great question as well, because sometimes we don't understand what the difference is. So a great question when I teach serve safe is the difference between cleaning and sanitizing is cleaning is removal of visible dirt and grime, right? And sanitizing is with the removal and the elimination to healthy um, levels of pathogens. <clears throat> so for instance, um, you're never gonna eat off your kitchen floor. You wanna clean that just like the walls and the sink and things like that. They don't have to be sanitized, but we wanna sanitize your cutting boards, your countertops, all of the tools and appliances you're using so that it's safe, especially if it comes in contact with any food product you're gonna consume, right? The other things we look at, <clears throat> unless you're doing a full renovation in your kitchen, you wanna make sure that you degrease your areas and perhaps repaint them. So for instance, underneath your kitchen sink, uh, that's one of the chores that's on my list is uh, degreasing underneath there and then repainting it for the time being until I rip this whole thing apart and, and redo my kitchen. Uh, you wanna make sure your clean supplies are segregated from anything else you have, whether it's outside, um, because you know the last thing you wanna do is have your Ajax um, fall down and it looks like baking powder. Um, and I've seen some stories where people, you know, they're using different um, labels or they're looking, looking at different containers to put their cleaning supplies in. So those are things you want to make sure that you're segregated. Any clean supplies, any liquids, any powders that you use to clean, keep them completely segregated from things that are you're going to be cooking with. So you shouldn't be in the pantry if that's where you're storing your food. And then what I do is I clean as I go. Right. This is another, um, this is another uh, saying we have in the kitchen, clean as you go. Um, some people that are learning to cook, they just have a big pile of stuff at the end. Um, but I never use my dishwashing machine. So I just basically, you know, your area is a small sink. I soak things in, in water. And as I have a couple of seconds, I'll wash things, sanitize them, let them air dry before I put them back in the cupboard. And you know, once you get in that habit, it becomes so easy to maintain and enjoy cooking for others. And I still cook every single night. My wife's wonderful, but she does she, she prefers me to cook. So I clean as I go, I organize it as I go, and um, I cross utilize as I go. The other thing we do is um, you can invest in shelf liners. And there's a couple of different ones, but the ones that have a little mesh on there are really great because you could put away things that are slightly damp and it'll still dry. The tip of that glass will still dry. There's enough space. And the shelf liners are meant to really uh, stay off of the, the shelf, right? And so every so often those should be cleaned. Mine are overdue. And a lot of times you can find it in some of these discount places like um, Target and Ross and maybe TJ Maxx. You can get these shelf liners, cut them as you need, get rid of the old ones, and you feel good. It's like a shower liner, you know? And those need to be replaced as you go once in a while. Maybe you can clean them. I don't know. I've never put them in the dishwasher. I mean, the clothes washing machine, but let me know if you've anybody's ever done that. It's probably just basically easier just to rip them out and put new ones in. Next, food preparation. We have the benefit of having the convenience of, well, it used to be 24 hour stores. Now, I guess they've reduced that, but purchase only for a week or two at a time because anytime we go to Costco, I have a list. I don't go there and cruise. Um, what happens is I run out of space and then I forget that I bought it or it just jams the entire refrigerator up. And man, oh man, you're, you're just trying to consume more than you should be eating. So I purchase one to two weeks at a time, depending on what the product is. Uh, if I don't need to go to Costco, 
I'll just go to the local, gro local grocery store and buy only what I need. I don't have that much space to put stuff, and which is a good thing because it's fresher. And when I buy things in the back of my mind, so for instance, you can only buy a three pound container of Greek yogurt. Um, and I like Greek yogurt, but I don't like it every freaking day. So what are you gonna use with that Greek yogurt, right? Can you make a sauce from it? Can you cross utilize it and put it into something else? Can you make a dessert from it? Can you give it away to some people that need it for your neighbors? So we try to cross utilize everything. Uh, the things that go that, you know, like when I buy a bag of um, like bean sprouts, right? And I use it for pho or I use it for a stir fry. You, know, you still have a, a good amount left, but it only lasts for one to two days. So I start thinking about what else I can, I can use it for, then I'm not gonna get bored using it. Same thing with fresh spinach, right? The, same thing with anything that's gonna be perishable within five days. So we think about what we can use when I'm cross utilizing things. And so it doesn't spoil because the savings you made on that bulk purchase was just eliminated when you threw it out. I tend to buy more dry products that are shelf stable than frozen. So there's a lot of incredible, great prepared food in the freezer, but you have to have space for it and you have to consume it at a certain point. So less frozen product, prepared product, less cans. And when you do looking, when you are looking for cans, you want to make sure they're not dented, they're not expired, the label's still untapped, it's not corroded, and it hasn't been frozen before, right? So when I'm using canned product, it's usually tomato product or tomato paste. Obviously, we love spam, um, but you know, I'll buy it once in a while and only when it's on sale because that's when I'll use it for when my son comes and wants a musubi or something like that, which I rarely eat. Um, but those are things I start thinking about buying more dry products that are that are cooked from scratch than convenience products, which you need to use and has a shelf life, right? Um, the other things we use is I always watch the amount of product that I prep and cook. I used to create large amounts and then I get tired of it and you start dumping it out. And that's money down the drain, right? So I kind of like measure how much we're going to consume and I go a little bit less because um, I don't want a lot of leftovers, right? And, you know, my wife's not going to eat all these leftovers and you can't feed dogs all this stuff either because they're just going to get sick. So, but when I do that, I always make sure that when I'm reheating it, I reach a certain temperature. It's 165 to 15 seconds. That's going to be on the exam. And cooling things down, you can cool it from 135 to 70 within two hours. And then from 70 to 41, which is the temperature of your refrigerator, within four. So you've got a total of six hours to cool hot food down. And you can cool it at room temperature as long as you're maintaining it. If it gets to room temperature, you can put it in the fridge, but you don't want to put anything, anything that's piping hot directly in your refrigerator because you're going to compromise your entire refrigerator, right? The refrigerator is just to maintain temperatures. It's really not geared to cool it down, okay? Um, and then this, the, the three-second rule. Is that a real thing, three seconds? If you drop something on the floor at home, like a steak, do you throw that in the garbage can? No, Brad does not do that, right? You're gonna wash it off. And as long as it's clean, your floor is clean, you can wash it off. In food service, we don't do that. We do probably throw things away because we can, we're serving a clean customer, right? So those are things that we think about. Three second rule, yeah. It depends on how dirty your floor is, I guess. And then six hours for cooling. Um, and then maintaining the temperature of your hot food and cold food is very important because temperature and time is money. That's what we think about in the industry is that the temperature, if you don't have temperature controls, that can get very expensive. Now, talking about these food saver bags, right? The food saver is a, is a little machine that sucks all the air out, right? And that's, you know, about a hundred bucks. And you've got to buy these special bags and then put them in there and seal them, okay? So if you're buying like a, a bunch of steaks or chicken or shrimp or whatever, and you want to subdivide it, that thing shrink wraps it, and then you can put it in the fridge, which will keep for quite a while, or you can put it in the freezer and pull it back out. The oxygen is what really makes um, your product develop this, what we call freezer burn, right? Now, 
What I was talking about earlier with, with this thing called an emergent circulator, some of you may or may not be familiar with the term sous vide, but it's basically an, it's an immersion in hot water that has a specific temperature that you cook it to for, you know, from one hour to a week, okay? And you have to have it in a sealed bag. So what you could do is you study up on this, you just Google it, and you can use these food saver bags or Ziploc bags, and you can marinate your meat or season it, zip it up, put it in this container. It can be a plastic, um, a polycarbonate container, food style, or it can be in a stock pot with water. You put this emergent circulator that has a heating element inside there, and it just basically revolves the water. It just circulates the water. You can time it and set a temperature, and this product will cook this food at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time and it'll fully cook a product or it can cook it partially depending on what you want so let me give you an example i went to a barbecue they, i was invited to a barbecue and they said hey dean bring some meat to cook okay well i want to have fun i want to have a beverage i want to go into the pool i don't want to be slaving over a grill so what i did is i seasoned some chicken maybe chicken legs and i um got a couple of steaks nice thick steaks and i seasoned them all up then I put it in my food saver and I vacuum packed it. Then I put it in this warm immersion circulator and I cooked it for a certain amount of hours at 145 degrees or 155 degrees. And I let it cook for hours. When the thing was done, I dumped the water and I let it cool and I let it cook, cool it in the refrigerator. When I got to the barbecue site the next couple of days from there, I said, hey, let's turn the barbecue on and when you're ready to eat, it'll take me 10 minutes to sear these things off and warm them up because the product was fully cooked. And instead of slaving over this grill, all I had to do is brown it a little bit, make sure it's seasoned, make sure it doesn't stick to the grill. And my God, by the time I pulled it off the grill, sliced the steak, it was perfectly medium rare and all the chicken was fully cooked. So if you have any questions about that particular appliance, let me know, I can give you more details. Okay, personal hygiene. This should have been actually first because that's what we do now. We want to wash our hands often in warm, soapy water, hot running water. We want to make sure that we have towels, paper towels that are disposable, um, or a blow dryer. And we want to make sure we have soap. How long should we wash your hands? Well, in food service, it's the same as at home. You want to wash it for at least 20 seconds. You want to wash your hands and scrub your cuticles and nails. And you want to wash it to your forearms or so, right? And you want to wash it with two verses of happy birthday to you, right? That's what the kind of rule is. So you want to wash your hands, dry it completely. If you want to wear gloves, you can wear gloves at home. It's kind of weird if you're wearing gloves, but you could, right? Because the whole point is reducing the amount of um, pathogens from your hands. Humans are the number one carrier of disease, right? So having a mask on, you don't need to wear a mask at home, but when we're in the kitchen now, people are asking to wear masks and wear gloves. Um, this prevents cross-contamination and cross-contamination is um, the transfer of harmful pathogens to something that's ready to eat or cross-contaminating contaminating things um, from one surface to the other that shouldn't be on them. So for instance, if you're butchering chicken, raw chicken, and you're slicing lettuce on there, uh, somebody's gonna get sick, right? So you wanna make sure that everything's sanitized, you change your gloves for a ready-to-eat product, and then you can work on the ready-to-eat products, okay? So cross-contamination is the transfer of fungal pathogens, right, to some ready-to-eat product. On the other hand, there's another term that you may or may not know, it's called cross-contact, and that's the transfer of harmful allergens, um, to ready to eat food. So wheat, um, cooked shellfish, um, garlic, some people are allergic to those things. And you wanna make sure that we realize what's in the ingredients and we know that we're not gonna cross contact something that's ready to eat. If you have helpers in your kitchen or volunteers or somebody to pop up, right? You can actually share the information as well and they should be following the same thing. Um, for clothing, a lot of us uh, are very casual at home, right? And so, uh, you know, it's good to wear something when you're cooking, anything, 
whether it's an apron or a shirt. And it's also good to wear something that covers your feet because you never know what happens, whether it's hot oil or water or a knife that falls, right? It's good to have your feet um, covered as well, just in case. So, you know, if you have a smock you can wear, wear clothing, things splatter all the time, um, things get all over the place. And so make sure you have clothing and fresh dish towels, right? So don't use a bath towel, don't use a facial towel. You can invest in kitchen towels that you can dispose of later on. Uh, there's always kitchen towels at um, Ross and TJ Maxx that you can get. Um, but it's good to have nice dry kitchen towels. If you have a damp kitchen towel and you're pulling something out of the oven, it can burn you as, as, as fast as ever because that water is a conductor for heat and it turns immediately to steam in your kitchen towel and you'll drop that product. Um, the other thing is, you know, I love to taste food. Things are looking good, right? But um, if you're cooking for others or uh, you're cooking in the industry, we don't lick our fingers or taste with our fingers. We use a spoon that we sanitize and, and dip in again. So we use the little sanitizer or you just have spoons ready to go and you can use a tasting spoon for that, right? It's not a good sign when you're seeing your cook at a restaurant licking their fingers and tasting the food. They're ensuring that's gonna be seasoned, but you know, this day and age of COVID, it's a, it's a little disgusting, right? So, you know, we wanna maintain our storage areas. Uh, we want to use the sharpest knives as possible. Um, in the handouts that I have in my file, the G drive file, there is, I think there's a little section on how to sharpen your knives or using the steel. Uh, you want to make sure you wear safe clothing or aprons, right? Uh, as sexy as that may sound in terms of not wearing clothing, it's better and safe to wear clothing, right? You want to prevent accidental burns and falls by making sure you're your, your floors are, are relatively clean and uh, slip free. So it's, it's just, just as important to clean your, your, um, your, kitchen, your kitchen floors, right? Uh, even though you might have pets, wash your, wash your floors. Uh, wash your hands properly, use dry towels to handle hot pans. And I think that's something that we see sometimes. We don't realize that we have a damp towel. We're reaching for a, you know, a cast iron pan. And then when you're, you know, when you're cooking, if you do have a fire on your stove, which is probably rare, I've seen them, several of them in my time, is that you don't want to just get the hose and start spraying. You want to make sure that the heating element is off, your gas is off. You want to get a tight fitting um, lid and smother it with a dry towel and smother that out. Don't, you know, your first thing shouldn't be get the fire extinguisher out if it's a small, like oil fire. Because sometimes you're frying shallots or something and it gets out and you forgot about it or you're watching a TV show or you got a phone call. So you want to make sure that you smother the fire with something that's non, that's fireproof and it'll should go out. Don't throw stuff at it. Don't throw flour at it. Don't put water on it. It's just going to spread. Let me tell you, if it's an oven fire, turn the oven off, try to find the source and put it out with a, a big towel. I mean, sacrifice a towel, not your house, okay? This is not an exam, but if you go to Kahoot it, we'll have a little quiz for you. Are you ready? This is the number. And I'm gonna go, if you can still see that, I am going to check it out. Okay, so you go to Kahoot.it, I think. And that's the game number. Who's been listening? I'm not doing Kahoot, but I'm watching. And okay, listening. you can watch, Angie. You can shout them out.
You don't have to be a chef to play. Are you gonna show your screen, um, Dean? Is it not showing? Oh yeah, okay, I'll show this one, yeah. I'll wait till everybody gets in and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll switch it to the Kahoot. We got nine. How many we need? We have 14 people here. So nine is pretty good. Okay, well, we can start. Copy the number down if you want. Um, there we go. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Okay, ready? Let's go. Wow, okay. Good job. We're going for speed now. Whoa. Wow, somebody's really smart. Okay. Good. Drink while cooking. I love that. Ooh, it's 165. Yeah. Good job, good job. Casually throw it towards the destination you're heading for safety. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's a joker. Oh man, the cat is in the lead and has been keeping in the lead. Right. 
Good job. Okay. Mm, 15 seconds minimum. This should be good. Yeah, sometimes it's difficult with a tiny little refrigerator. Okay, halfway through. Good job. Sometimes I'm getting sick at potlucks. Good, good. Oh, good job. Ooh, everybody ace that. Six hours maximum. You can do it. You can do it less. All right. Coming down to the wire here. Seven days, you get a week. Three more.
Salmonella. All right, shaking it up. Two left. Good job. That's right, east it. Last one. Kitty cat's in the lead. Has been in the lead. All right. Okay, who won? Ron's third, Joyce second. And, and who's the cat? That's me, Kehal. <laughs> oh, good job, Kehal. My mom is a cook, so I, I should know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks for playing. As uh, always, there are no prizes, but just bragging rights. Okay, so uh, let me uh, play this. All right, so so what, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about sanitation and safety in the kitchen, but what can you apply it to? Hey, you can apply it to uh, applied math. So I did teach a, a class called Applied Mathematics with Culinary Arts to DOE um, instructors. And so, you know, you can use some of this knowledge to incorporate in anything you teach if it's related to food. And when you say something about food, people's ears tend to perk up. And there's a lot of things to talk about with food because we do that on a daily basis, multiple times a day, right? Unless you're on a crazy, you know, diet competition, Christy Misty sets up, right? But we, you know, we, but we can drink a lot of water. So those, these are the couple of things you might be able to consider in terms of incorporating, whether you have children or whether you have classes or whether you have conversation, because uh, I love to talk about food and because there's not one, usually one single answer to them, but it's, it, it starts a discussion and it perpetuates, right? So why does heated chocolate seeds when water is incorporated or, you know, well, what is a chef's toe? Well, that's what it's called. And why is it feeded and so high? And what's the history of that? Uh, and what, what's the tradition, right? Why are uniforms designed to be baggy? Because if you wear skin tight stuff and some marinara sauce or caramel spills on you, you're not gonna be burnt and have scars instead of tattoos, right? Uh, you know, hey, what is better tasting? Grass fed animals or grain fed? You know, it depends on what you raise and what you like, right? For allied health, right? What's the best way to stop bleeding? Manage and burn, reduce infections, right? Make sure your teeth are okay. Um, you know, how much fat is in a hot dog? Read the labels on the stuff that you buy to understand the dynamic of what you're using and buying, right? Hey, I looked at the back of a hot dog, 29% fat, right? It, you know, because it needs that moisture. If it didn't have any fat at all, it'd be, it'd be like, you know, It'd be dry, it'd be like cardboard, right? And then history is interesting. I always find that I'm mean, listening to the podcast driving 35 minutes to Lahaina to and from each way. So I'm listening to these podcasts and I find I look at the podcasts that are you know fascinating to me. And you talk about, you know, whether it's um uh Marie Antoinette or Catherine de, Catherine de Medici, hey, they had some influences on food. You know, why is that important? Well, because she brought pistachios and gelato and Parmesan cheese to the court, French court. So those are things that are fascinating. You know, what is the byproduct that creates blue cheese? Hey, well, 
coincidence, it's penicillin, right? The thing that helps with uh, uh, antibiotics and, and maintaining your, uh, your, your antibiotic system. So those are things that you can consider when you're having these conversations or it could be a, a start for a conversation, right? So before I leave, I, do, I did have a link in the chat that has this presentation, uh, some extra notes of what created the presentation and also some recipes. So sorry if you can hear that, we're working on the yard. But I always think about Costco chicken. So my wife, once in a while, she buys this Costco chicken for six bucks, right? And it's nice and beautiful and hot. But sometimes we have leftovers. And so I thought it'd be great to share a couple of very um, easy and you know five ingredient recipes with you today that I have printed in that Google Drive, okay? So one, which, you know, if you're Asian or you like this chicken, it's called cold chopped chicken, although I added garlic to it. So I get green onion that I, I get it from the grocery store and I don't chop off the roots and I throw it in the ground. And so it perpetuates green onion. And so we get some green onion, we get a little bit of peeled ginger, chop it up, a little bit of garlic, chop that up. And you can use hot oil, whether it's hot or cold, right? The hot provides a different cons consistency to it. And then as much salt as you can stand, and I either get a mortar and pestle or I put it in the food processor and pulse it, just pulse it. And it creates this emerald community here at Postal Store. All the windows are open case. And where it provides the emerald green little sauce, usually for poached Chinese style cold chopped chicken, and it's meant to be served cold with a little bit of salt. Uh, but you can use it on anything. You can use it on fish. You can use it on, well, you might be able to use it on meat, but typically fish or chicken, you can use it on, or even vegetables. So I have the recipe on the handout, but it's great to share this bland chicken with a spicy, not spicy, but salty, flavorful sauce. Ginger and garlic are the two things that, and scallions of Chinese love, right? And then the other one is when I was living in Guam, they have this tomorrow finadeni sauce, which you may or may not have heard of. The people are bringing me tons of calamansi lime right now. They're these little tiny little limes that smell like tangerines and they're full of seeds. And you know, you cut, cut it in half and squeeze the juice out and it's wonderful, even with a cocktail, a little bit of gin, right? You can use lemon juice or vinegar, but basically equal amounts of lime or lemon juice or vinegar equal amounts of soy sauce. I like Yamasa, um, three ounces of green onion, thinly sliced. And then the thing about this is you put hot chilies in there. So it's either Hawaiian chilies, the really tiny ones, you can chop a few up depending on how hot they are. In Guam, they call it Doni or it's chili peppers or the Thai chilies or Serrano red chili, red Serrano chilies chopped really fine. Um, you don't need any salt because that's all to show you and then a little bit of fresh garlic. And all you do is you just melt it together and it's this beautiful, colorful, salsa looking sauce and you can put it over barbecued meats. I tend to put just a tiny bit of sugar to balance out that vinegar. It basically just kind of um, is a complement to the vinegar, to the acid. And if you wanna put a couple of cherry tomatoes that are quartered in there, all you do is mix it, let it blend together and you can use it as a dipping sauce on grilled meats, whether it's meat, poultry, uh, fish, whatever you want. But those are the things that are a lot of fun. Um, so what I can do, here's a QR code if you want to scan it and have it on your phone, right? But uh, I put a link in the chat that has the link to the G drive and it says, I think my owl safety and it has Fire safety has a couple of other things in it, but it has a presentation in my notes for this thing and the recipes. Um, but, but, you know, thank you very much for participating. Um, how do I get my cursor? There you go. Stop share. Okay, so thanks everyone for participating. I have enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Uh, if you have any questions or you can email me later on about 
any cooking questions or if you're interested in the circulation machines, they run from, I don't know, 200 bucks on down. There's tons of them out there. You can look on Amazon and there's a bunch of them. I'll tell you which ones that I have that work well. Uh, there are some that are very slim where you can actually travel with them if you're into that. But then there's some that, you know, a lot of them are on Wi-Fi or a Wi-Fi system that you can manage and actually program so that if you're at work, you can have this thing cooking like a slow cooker all day and you can turn it on or turn it off depending on what you want to do with it. Um, there's tons of websites that help you navigate, uh, you know, the stuff in the bag. But it's, it's the sous vide method if you want to get into that. I mean, one, one thing that I like is I like poached eggs once in a while. You can put just whole poached eggs in this hot water, start it, turn it on, circulate it at 145 degrees for one hour, and you'll have poached eggs ready to go. And it cracks beautifully. And you can do it ahead of time if you have guests or potlucks. Uh, you can bring these in if you have an electrical outlet and warm it up and, and play with it. So thank you very much for allowing me to share my information with you. And I hope you had a good time. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Dean.